Hello, everyone. Good morning and welcome to Worship with the Unitarian Universalist Church of Ventura. I am the Reverend Dana Warsnop, and it is my great pleasure and honor to serve this congregation as its minister and also to wrestle with the technology trickster gods that have it in for us some mornings. And I'm doing, I'm happy to do that on all our behalf. <laughs> and I am Worship Associate Sue Brinkmeyer. We welcome you all into this virtual space made sacred by our presence together. We begin each service by acknowledging that the land each of us is on is the ancestral home of indigenous peoples. Theirs was a sacred relationship with the land. May we too be aware of all inhabitants, previous and present, and walk reverently upon these lands, carrying their memory. If you have been around very long, or if you are new to us and did a little research about Unitarian Universalism before arriving in this Zoom room, you probably already know about our seven principles. Our theme this month has been story. And today we tell some of the story of our living tradition, how we keep evolving and growing. And we'll also tell the story of how a new movement for civil rights is calling us to grow and evolve and change our principles by adding an eighth. So I invite you all to sit back and enjoy a few stories of this living tradition this morning. Ah. So let us now breathe together, opening our hearts to one another and new ways of living our pr principles, living our faith. Let us at last enter sacred space. We hope that everyone here has a chalice or a candle to light and something to light it with. Let's light our chalices together. We begin our service this morning with words adapted from Reverend Cecil Williams Minister Emeritus of Glide Memorial Church in San Francisco. We come together in acknowledgement of our need for one another. Some of us need to be heard, but have no one who will listen. Some of us need to be loved, and some of us need to love. Some of us want to change, but it's too painful. Some of us are lonely, but afraid to tell anyone. Some of us are sick of ourselves and others, but don't know what to do about it. Some of us want to be ourselves, but it seems as though other people won't let us. Some of us want the world to be a better place, but feel weighed down by a sense of futility. Some of us don't even know what we want, but hope we can find it here. We come together, sometimes in fear, sometimes in trust, sometimes in pain, sometimes in joy, but always in hope and faith that we can help and strengthen each other in our quest for healing. Come, let us worship together. Good morning, I'm Carolyn Bierke, the music director, and I'd like to invite you to join me in singing our opening hymn, I'm On My Way. I'm on my way, great God, I'm on my way. 
you, Carolyn. Good morning. My name is Fidelity Balmer. I'm the religious education coordinator for our lovely and thriving congregation. For today's time for the child, we're going to be doing something a little bit different. So today we're sharing a video titled, What is the Eighth Principle? And this is a message for all ages that was created by Meg McGuire, and she is serving as the ministerial intern at the Unitarian Universalist Society of San Francisco. What is the eighth principle? Well, you know our seven principles, right? They're things that matter to us. Things that guide how we are as a community, how we treat each other, and what we want to bring more of into the world. Just like each of us is always learning and growing, we know our principles have to grow sometimes too. This is the story of the eighth principle. A few years ago, some UU leaders spoke up. They told us, these principles we love, they left something out. Like many who'd come before them, they spoke about how people still aren't being treated fairly because of the color of their skin, or where they come from, or other things that make them who they are. And that happens not only in the world at large, but even in our congregations, even in this one. So we need to do more to make sure that all people can feel welcome and loved here. We need to say more about our commitments to fight against racism, because racism hurts everybody. In fact, it hurts all seven of our principles. And so, the eighth principle was born. The eighth principle is a commitment to fight against racism and oppression, and to build a beloved community of love and trust and belonging here in our church and in the world around us. We're going to be talking about the Eighth Principle a lot this spring, learning about it and what it means for this community. What does the Eighth Principle mean to you? What does the eighth principle mean to you? I've been reflecting on an answer to this question over the course of the last week. And I think back to our previous week in our religious education classroom with our cartoons kids, our elementary schoolers. We had our kids write out messages of hope and inspiration in solidarity with Asian Americans across the US in the wake of various hate crimes. And the messages that our young people put together were filled with hope, care, and support. Every person is important. All people should be treated fairly and equally and simply be kind. All came up for them as important to share as messages of hope, inspiration, and solidarity. So to me, the eighth principle is a representation of the promise we make to our children that their faith tradition is advocating for and supporting the rights of all groups of people. That's what it means to me. Mm, thank you, Fidelity. So much. Each Sunday, this congregation gives away our collection to an organization in the community or to funds that help people in our church. We now invite you to donate online and you will see the link on the next slide and hopefully we'll get it posted in the chat as well. Our offering today goes to cause the Central Coast Alliance United for a Sustainable Economy, which builds grassroots power and strengthens voices throughout the community. Cause is working on many fronts to protect vulnerable communities and also to protect our environment. Recently, Cause organized coalitions to oppose the expansion of a polluting gas compressor 
across the street from E.P. Foster Elementary School and the Avenue Boys and Girls Club in West Ventura. This compressor has leaked harmful chemicals into the air, and now there are plans to expand it. CAUSE is asking for a complete environmental impact report, demanding that Southern California Gas create a plan to clean up toxic, toxic soil and shut down the station. That is among their efforts. Here are a couple of more. CAUSE also provides education to farm workers about wage theft and about rules that guarantee them COVID-related sick time. And on May Day, they organized a car caravan calling attention to the need for legislative reform to support essential workers and to support tenants who are at risk of displacement as uh, the result of rising rents. Thank you. Thank you so much for giving generously as you always do. There were no mirrors in my Nana's house. No mirrors in my Nana's house. There were no mirrors in my Nana's house. No mirrors in my Nana's house. And the beauty that I saw in everything, the beauty in everything, yeah, it was in her eyes. Oh, the sun was in her eyes. I'm telling you, there were no mirrors in my Nana's house. No mirrors in my Nana's house. I never knew that my skin was too black, and I never knew that my nose was too black, and I never knew that my clothes didn't fit, and I never knew there were things that I missed, cause the beauty in everything, oh, was in her eyes, and the sun was in her eyes, oh, there were no mirrors in my nana. There were no mirrors in my nana's house. There were no mirrors in my nana's house. I was intrigued by the cracks in the wall. The dust and the sun looked like snow that would fall. The noise in the hallway was music to me. The trash and the rubbish would cushion my feet. And the beauty in everything oh, was in her eyes. The sun was in her eyes. The world outside was a magical place. I only knew love and I didn't know hate. And the beauty in everything was in her eyes. The sun was in her eyes. There were no mirrors in my nana's house. There were no mirrors in my nana's house. And the beauty that I saw in everything, the beauty in everything, was in her eyes. The sun was in her eyes. The sun was in her eyes. Oh, my, we are grateful for so much in this congregation, including the music of Issei Barnwell. Gra grateful for the generosity of this congregation, which weaves a tapestry of love and of beauty we call community. Each week, we lift up the joys and sorrows that have been shared with our community. You can submit a joy or a sorrow in two ways, either from a link on the website, uuventura.org, or from a link in our Thursday email bulletin, UUCV This Week. 
when we are together in our physical sanctuary, we drop stones in water for each joy or sorrow. The ripples that go out remind us that we are all connected. Here in our online sanctuary we make together today, we see the image of ripples to help us keep that connection. I invite you now to speak aloud or hold in your heart the names of those you wish to celebrate or memorialize or those who may need the loving embrace of this community. You can also put the names in the chat by invoking their names, even when we may not hear them. You bring them into this circle of caring that we call community. We hold these names, spoken and unspoken, in the silent sanctuary of our hearts. May we be truly grateful for all that is our life. Please join me in singing Wo Ya Ya. For a reading in two voices, The Free Church by 20th century Unitarian theologian James Luther Adams. I call that church free, which enters into covenant with the ultimate source of existence, that sustaining and transforming power not made with human hands. This free church binds together families and generations, protecting against the idolatry of any human claim to absolute truth or authority. This covenant is the charter and responsibility and joy of worship in the face of death as well as life. I call that church free which brings individuals into caring, trusting fellowship that protects and nourishes their integrity and spiritual freedom, that yearns to belong to the church universal. It is open to insight and conscience from every source. It bursts through rigid tradition, giving rise to new and living language, to new and broader fellowship. It is a pilgrim church 
a servant church on an adventure of the spirit. The goal is the prophethood and priesthood of all believers. The one for the liberty of the mind and of prophesying, the other for the ministry of healing. It aims to find unity in diversity under the promptings of the spirit that bloweth where it listeth and maketh all things new. I invite you now into a time of stillness, meditation, reflection. Take a few moments to arrive as fully as you can in your body, wherever you are. Feeling your connection to the ground and to one another, even in this virtual gathering. How are you learning and growing? How are you building new ways? How are you finding your way through getting there, although you may not always know where you are going. How are you living your faith? Your living faith. How has your faith grown and evolved as your human spirit has? Take some time now in silence and consider.
right from the gun Trying not to cry Barely holding on What the hell going on? Do you know who you are? Do you know who we are? We So here we are. I'm arriving here, perhaps finally. I have managed to lead my homilies the last two Sundays by talking about evolution. So let's just make it three. For evolution is a thread woven throughout the stories of Unitarians and Universalists and of Unitarian Universalists. Yes, we were among the first faiths who accepted the truths revealed in Darwin's theory of evolution Indeed, Darwin himself had some Unitarian roots, and yet it goes deeper than that. We are an evolving faith ourselves, changing and growing as we learn new things. We call ours a living tradition, which is why our gray hymnal, is titled Singing the Living Tradition and the Teal Supplement is on the other side over here. Our Teal Supplement is called Singing the Journey for we don't stand still for very long at all. We indeed don't always know exactly where we're going but we know where we will get there. Now, our current seven principles of Unitarian Universalism are 35 years old. Well, actually 36 officially, which means that there are not many of us here who remember by experience what came before. We tend to think of the seven principles as settled things, though such permanence was never intended. So a little history is helpful here. The Unitarians and the Universalists merged in 1961, officially then becoming the Unitarian Universalist Association of Congregations. And at the time of the merger, there were all sorts of issues to be discussed and negotiated and figured out. A statement of principles was among them. And yet given all the other matters under consideration, the statement was an amalgam of Unitarian and Universalism that was acceptable to all. Though it was not considered permanent at that time either, there were six principles in 1961. I expect some of this language will sound familiar and some of it will be mm, a bit surprising. The preamble stated, the members of the Unitarian Universalist Association dedicated to the principles of a free faith unite in seeking one, to strengthen one another in a free and disciplined search for truth as the foundation of our religious fellowship. 
to cherish and spread the universal truths taught by the great prophets and teachers of humanity in every age and tradition immemorially summarized in the Judeo-Christian heritage as love to God and love to man. To affirm and defend, to affirm, uh, to affirm, defend and promote the supreme worth of every human personality, the dignity of man and the use of the democratic process in human relationships. Hmm. 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 There's just some language in there that doesn't set right these days. And here now are the final three. We seek to implement our vision of one world by striving for a world community founded on ideals of brotherhood, justice, and peace to serve the needs of member churches and fellowships, to organize new churches and fellowships, and to extend and strengthen liberal religion, to encourage cooperation with men of goodwill in every land. Well, those principles were workable for the time and in that place. But golly, they have not aged especially well, have they? In 1961, our country and our faith were grappling with many societal upheavals, beginning with the civil rights movement and then simultaneously women's rights, anti-war and gay rights movements. And we, the people of the Unitarian Universalist Association were grappling and evolving right along with it all. Some of the changes over the time. In 1961, there were maybe three ordained UU women ministers. By 1968, there were 21, which was all of 2%. In 1978, the numbers grew to 6% of our ministers. By 88, it was 25%. In 1998, it was 49%. And somewhere around the turn of the 21st century, women became more than 50% of UU ordained clergy. And throughout that whole time, as the women's movement progressed, UU women ordained and lay began to chafe just a little of the patriarchal language in those original six principles. Phrases like the dignity of man and all men of goodwill didn't cut it anymore because it wasn't inclusive enough. And by the late 1970s, those women ushered in a process to re-envision our principles, to rewrite them, but to re and spirit them and revise them completely. Now, that process takes time in our governance system. Folks from all over the continent and all over our theological spectrum gathered, working late into many nights over several years, arguing, fighting, compromising, forgiving, and eventually persevering in coming up with a new statement and six principles that all could embrace. Here are our more familiar words. Our first principle 
affirming and promoting the inherent worth of, and dignity of every person, carrying us well beyond the dignity of man. And take note that in 1961's there was 1961, there was a free and disciplined search for truth. And now in 1985, it has become a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. And the others that we have come to know and love. But wait a minute, this is only six. Come on, there's something missing here. But you might say, my, the seventh principle, our seventh principle is my favorite. And it is true. It was not in the original six. And I love the story of how the seventh principle finally made it to the list. The, now, the principle, this new document of principles was first brought to General Assembly in 1984 in Columbus, Ohio. And it came to the floor for debate and approval with just these six principles. And yet after all the years of tenacious and sometimes contentious work, the most transformative of our seven principles was composed in a matter of minutes by a small group on the floor of General Assembly. And it was brought to the floor as an amendment. Someone moved to add a seventh principle of respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part, and it was seconded and carried like that. Yep, there it is in all its glory. For another change had been wrought between the 1960s and the 1980s, the environmental movement blossomed. And again, the UUA changed and grew. And we began that we, to see that we needed to embrace not just individual freedom of conscious, conscience and practice, but a collective responsibility to ourselves, to each other, and yes, to the earth, to this interdependent web of existence of which we are but a part. For you use are willing to live in the questions, to live in the paradoxes of existence. There is a kind of dynamic tension between the individual and the community which our first and seventh principles embody. They have always felt to me like beautiful bookends of all that in, in, are in between. Now, any changes to our bylaws and the principles are article two of our bylaws. Any changes to the UA bylaws need to be voted on at two general assemblies. So final approval of our seven principles came at last in 1985 in Atlanta, Georgia. That was over 35 years ago, encompassing nearly four decades of momentous change. Think how the world has changed since 1985. And so now there are two overlapping efforts to re-envision our principles again after all these years of change. There is an Article II study commission considering the whole of the principles, the whole document itself, the principles of the purposes and the sources all together. And there is also the eighth principle project which is advocating directly for adding an eighth principle, which would have us explicitly embrace racial justice. It reads, 
We, the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association, covenant to affirm and promote journeying towards spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and in our institutions. Though the times are currently very ripe for considering this eighth principle, it too has roots going back decades. Yes, back all the way into the 1960s. UUs were among the most supportive churches and church members outside of the black community most supportive of the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. This is a point of pride we have earned. Yet after the key victories of that movement, we struggled with making changes that would bring this new awareness of racial justice into our hearts, our communities, into our practices, into our entire association. This is both understandable in some real ways and it is really disappointing. It is true that it's the rest of the culture didn't do brilliantly either. Indeed, conservatives went about dismantling the progress made in the 60s both overtly and surreptitiously, almost instantaneously through things like mass incarceration and a war on drugs that targeted deliberately, specifically people of color. And in the late 1960s, the UUA itself had a crisis that we now call the black empowerment controversy. Black UUs felt betrayed by our mostly white leadership when we did not embrace systemic and institutional change. Some left in despair. Others stayed still devoted yet repeatedly discouraged and disappointed again and again. Reading some of the history of that time, it is actually rather eerie how similar the issues of that controversy are to the ones that we face today, both in our country and in our churches. African-American intellectual essayist and author, James Baldwin used the term white supremacy culture in the 1960s. It is gaining, it has gained currency with us in the last five years or so. It seems startlingly new and therefore I was actually startled when I discovered that James Baldwin had and others had been using it for decades. Using it the same way that Ta-Nehisi Coates is writing about it today, helping bring it in to our attention again this day. There has been a new civil rights movement that boiled over when Michael Brown was shot by a police officer in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014. And then this movement has been amplified by the murder of George Floyd just a year ago. This new civil rights movement is demanding that we do the work that we failed to do in the 80s and 90s and the first, de and the first decade of this new century. This has been a national failure on so many levels. 
though as Unitarian Universalists, we did little better than the rest of us all. People of color who deeply love our faith tradition have stuck with it through all these decades because this is their religious and spiritual home, even as they too often feel minimized and disregarded, as well as they have been telling us feeling gaslighted and discriminated against. Some who have spoken out have even received hate mail from fellow you use, which just hurts to know. And this is why Blue, Black Lives of Unitarian Universalism and others have proposed this eighth principle. Some have said that all the ideas in it are already encompassed by the first seven, at least implicitly, but that implicitness has not helped us make real and deep change. Adding an eighth principle means changing our bylaws. So specifically article two, and that process does not happen quickly. The eighth principle was first proposed in 2017 at General Assembly in New Orleans, Louisiana, where I voted in favor of it. It was in part a response to a hiring controversy which shook the UUA as an institution that year a highly qualified woman of color was passed over as a candidate for a significant UUA staff position. The job instead went to a white man and she was told she was not the right fit. Words which sound like a dog whistle to people of color. This was not the first time something like this had happened to her, and yet this time she was just done. She publicly called out the UUA for institutional racism and discrimination. And in the end, at least four key UUA staff resigned, including UUA president Peter Morales. And the people of color in our faith who are told in ways subtle and overt that they don't quite fit, have been telling us since that this is now our deep, perhaps our deepest work institutionally and personally. And so the eighth principle has been making its way through our governance process. Yet a groundswell began to surge after George Floyd's murder. And it is just, we are today just two days shy of the first anniversary of his death. So I invite you, the Unitarian Universalist community in Ventura to learn more about this eighth principle we have been talking about systemic racism and how white supremacy culture is woven through American society. We have been examining our own heart, hearts and our own church. And now we are being invited to consider how we will weave what we are learning and how we are growing into our entire living tradition you will soon be receiving an email that is inviting you to an online escape room in the next couple of weeks. It is a game created by religious educators and clergy to introduce this plain event about the um, this principle is considered here's virtual general assembly and then the be in general assembly in 2022 and in 2023.
at this point, 45 of our congregations have, have officially endorsed the new principle. And we too, as a congregation, may decide to endorse it. UUs are a lively, engaged, and evolving crew. These are pictures taken from the banner parade that opens GA each year when we are in person. And you see some familiar faces perhaps, and then the UUs from all over everywhere. We are often on the leading edges of cultural change, though not always. Sometimes it is so that we need to be challenged to lean in, to be a little or even a lot uncomfortable. The roots of the systemic racism and oppression in our country are more than 400 years old. And yet today we still live in that culture, which is a culture that harms us all yet also a culture that people who are white are too often consciously or unconsciously complicit in. A culture, yet it is also a culture that together we may yet overcome. It will take years and decades more to unravel and dismantle structures of racism in our land and in our association, in our churches, and in ourselves. Yet I am grateful to be part of a living religious tradition that wants to be a part of bending the moral arc of the universe toward justice. And even though the road may be muddy and rough, we're willing to journey together in ways we don't always know where they're taking us, but yet confident that we will get there. Heaven knows how, and yet we will get there. Amen. And may it be so. Please join me in prayer. Holy beingness of many names and no name, creative spark which brings forth new possibility, spirit of life which dwells within and among and beyond us this day and always. May we, may we keep our hearts ever open to the admonitions of the spirit to the call of reconciliation and healing, the sometimes uncomfortable call to learn and grow into new truths, newly revealed, not yet fully known. And may we take comfort in knowing that we are not alone, never, never alone, as we live into the possibility and promise of this living tradition, which we share. And may all those who are ill find healing. May those who are in despair find hope May those who are without shelter find home and may all those suffering conflict and war this day, especially in Palestine and Israel, may they, may we find peace. Amen and blessed be. Please join me in singing our closing hymn, We Shall Overcome.
please join Reverend Dana and me in extinguishing your chalice at home. We extinguish the flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. Those we carry in our hearts until we are together again. After the postlude, uh, everyone will be placed into breakout rooms for a virtual coffee hour. Uh, and if you are new among us, I sincerely invite you in. We are going to be creating, hopefully, a connecting room for newer people if you wish to uh, meet with Jimmy Vasquez, our membership coordinator, learn a little bit more about us. And if you wish, you can opt out of coffee hour altogether at this time. I leave you now with these words inspired by James Luther Adams. A living tradition is not simply something we inherit. Though it has been passed on by ancestors traced back for hundreds of years, a living tradition must be earned again and again in each generation, each generation anew, earned often with dust and heat on roads that can be muddy and rough. And it is also accompanied by a humble, humbling grace that acknowledges that life must grow and learn to continue. And there is always more to learn. So please, Go forth in peace, go forth in good health, go forth in love, may it be so. Mm -hmm.